Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we have here a special guest tonight, Howard Bloom. Uh, welcome at my channel. Thank you for accepting my invite to come and have a conversation. Well, Angelo, it's a pleasure. So um, um, I have not read your book, which uh, you wrote about uh, God. Hello, everyone. So uh, uh, let me just put the, the volume down here. Tonight. Yes, you have an echo. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, put the volume down. Okay. So, um, would you like to um, introduce uh, a few minutes yourself and uh, telling a little bit about uh, your book? Uh, I know that you are an atheist. Uh, uh, well, I, I okay. Um, I'm the author of seven books. Um, I appear once a week on 545 American radio stations. Um, I've uh, published or given lectures at scholarly conferences in 12 different fields um, from uh, quantum physics and cosmology to uh, neurobiology, evolutionary psychology, um, biosystems, uh, information science, and astronautics, of all things. Um, I run four science groups these days, which because I love to span all of the sciences. What I love to do with Angelo is span all of the sciences, use every discipline that my meager little mind can comprehend, and my meager little mind cannot comprehend everything, um, and fuse them together into a perceptual lens with which to see everything inside of us and everything outside of us from a rad radically new point of view. And um, I call what I do omnology, and the goal of the omnologist, of course, the word um, harbors a, an aspiration toward omniscience. And I believe that science must harbor an aspiration to omniscience, as difficult as that is, in fact, impossible to achieve. Um, but um, it's a field for the promiscuously curious, um, for people who are curious about a great many things. And whereas many people in science, I've spent my life in science since I was 10 years old. And whereas many people in science become specialists and they're like gophers in the landscape. They dig a hole so deep that all they can see is the darkness and the dirt around them. Um, and my goal since I was 16 years old has been to fly over the landscape and use all of those gopher holes as pixels and see the grand landscape in which things fit. So that's, and, so, and also, so in the pursuit of all of this, um, Channel 4 TV in Britain, this is horrible to say, but Channel 4 TV in Britain has said, I'm the Einstein, Newton, Darwin, and Freud of the 21st century, and, <laughs> and Buckminster Fuller's um, archivist, archivist said, I'm the Arthur C. Clarke and Buckminster Fuller of the 21st century. So that, that's me. But if you look at my books, they are all God-obsessed. Um, the first book, The Lucifer Principle, well, there's Lucifer right in the title, right? The mm -hmm. rebellious angel who uh, competed with God for power and was tossed out of the heavens. Um, the second book, Global Brain, uh, The Evolution of Mass Mind from the Big Bang to the 21st Century, doesn't have an obvious God reference in its title. The third book though, um, The Genius of the Beast is a little bit, no, it doesn't have God in its title either. Okay, so let me keep running down these books. Then there's a book called The God Problem that obviously has God in its title. It's called The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. And then there is the newest book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me. And one of the things I didn't tell you is that I did field work in popular culture for 20 years. And I founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry, even though I knew nothing about rock and roll when I started. And I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, ZZ Top, Run DMC, people like that. Um, <laughs> I either helped sustain their careers, or I helped establish their careers all the time. Remember, I'm a science mind. I got into theoretical physics, microbiology at the age of 10. 
So all the time using a hunt for pattern and a hunt for correlations, a hunt for the things that we look for in science as my one of my primary tools, which is why my, my company, despite the fact that I started out knowing nothing about rock and roll, that's one of the reasons that my company was a fabulous success. And then I went back to my science in 1988. But Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll is about the gods inside of us. And it's about a quest I've been on since the age of 12 to find those gods. Now, it's a rock and roll adventure because it's the stories of my work with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, all the rest of them that I've just mentioned. Um, and it's an amazing story because I was... I was digging for the soul of each one of these people. Um, it is, I used to preach to my clients that if you've come to me expecting that I will fashion uh, an artificial mask for you, an image, and I will, that I will tell you on the basis of this image, I'm going to make you a star, then I'm going to get you an appointment with my best competitor. I don't do that. If you're going to work with me, you have to understand that music is not an exchange. Uh, it, it's not like selling cornflakes. It is not an exchange of pieces of plastic. It is not an exchange of downloads. It's not an exchange of money. It's an exchange of raw human soul. And if you are willing to understand that, um, I will work with you. And But my job will be to become a secular shaman dive into your soul and find out the roots of your passions and then to keep you true to them. So, um, and, and I was guided when I was 12, um, I realized I was an atheist. And remember, I've been in science for two years at that point, which is a long time and reading two books a day. It's a long time when you're that young, it's uh, a sixth of your life. And, um, I suddenly realized I was an atheist, but I couldn't confess it to myself because I had a bar mitzvah coming up. And I was wildly unpopular in Buffalo, New York. Other kids wanted to have nothing to do with me whatsoever. And my parents didn't seem to want to have anything to do with me either. Um, so my pals, the people I hung around with, became Galileo and Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the guy who invented the microscope. And they couldn't turn me away. They couldn't say no. They couldn't pick up their baseball bats and gloves and move to an entirely different field just to get away from me, which is what the kids in my neighborhood had done once. Why? Why couldn't they say no? Because they were dead. But they became my companions. And when I was 12 years old, I started accumulating scientific credentials, and um, I co-designed a computer that won some science fair awards, I um, built my first Boolean algebra machine. I was taken to a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at my local university, the University of Buffalo. And I would imagine it was supposed to be a five minute courtesy call just to keep my mother happy. And uh, it turned out to be an hour because the hottest topic in science at that point was Big Bang versus steady state theory of the universe. And Fred Hoyle, who was the man promoting steady state theory, knew with absolute precision that by the end of that year, he would have demolished Big Bang Theory and it would never be heard of again. Fred Hoyle was wrong. But all of this hinged on the interpretation of the Doppler shift. So the head of the graduate physics department and I spent an hour brainstorming about the Doppler shift. And he came out of his office and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said to my mom, you don't have to save for grad school for him. He'll get fellowships in theoretical physics at any school he wants. So, and then my mom also arranged for me to get outside the box science tutoring from the head of research and development for the company that made the valves for the X1, the first plane to break the sound barrier, and for the X2, the first plane to take a human to the edge of space. So, but I realized, well, I had a weird experience. I, I, I set aside the idea that I was an atheist and so that I wouldn't have to admit it so I could have the bar mitzvah because if I confessed that I was an atheist, no bar mitzvah. And then I spent two months writing thank you notes for the presence. 
And when I was finished, I was able to confess to myself that I was an atheist. The problem was that was the end of August. And at the beginning of September come the Jewish high holidays. And I didn't want to go to the synagogue with my parents, um, but they managed to stuff me into a suit, which is almost impossible because I don't like suits at all. Um, and they stuffed me into their blue four-door Fraser automobile. I don't know how they accomplished that either. And then when we reached Richmond Avenue where the synagogue was and they parked, they tried to get me out of the car and I refused to go. So as I was holding on to the door frame of the car with both hands, and as my parents were pulling at me by the ankles, trying to drag me up the street like a sack of meat, um, willing to sacrifice their firstborn son on the pavement and turn his face into a shredded hamburger, I had a sudden realization. Galileo had his insights because he took a new military instrument that was designed to look at the horizon and see if there were enemy troops coming. The Spanish in those days wanted to get their hands on the Netherlands. <laughs> so they were always coming over the horizon. And the Dutch wanted to see them before the, the, um, the Spanish could realize they'd been spotted. So they created this tube, and it had a lens at each end. And it was, they called in English, a spyglass. Well, Galileo was up on uh, making sure that uh, the Italian city-states had absolutely the latest military technology. So he got wind of exactly how this thing was made, and he made one of his own. But the outrageous thing that he did was this. The instrument was designed for horizontal viewing, looking at the horizon. Galileo turned it in a totally unexpected direction. He turned it up at the sky. Now, everybody knew that was insane, and it was blasphemous. Why? Because the sky is God's underwear. The sky is the bottom of God's living room rug. <laughs> you do not look up God's underwear, period. Plus, everybody knew what was in the sky. Aristotle said that the circle and the sphere were the only perfect forms. So obviously, everything up there were perfect spheres and forms. So this was a blasphemous act. But what did Galileo see up there in the heavens? He saw lumpy stones. Lumpy stones, not spheres, <laughs> not perfect circles. Um, and it changed the relationship of humanity to the universe that we live in forever. And Anton von Leeuwenhoek was a draper. He imported fabrics to Amsterdam from all over the world. Global commerce had become very big um, in his time. And he used a lens for horizontal viewing to look at the fabrics that he was importing from overseas and see how fine the weave was. And he had the audacity, instead of using his lens horizontally, to turn his lens down and to look at pond water. And he discovered that we were sharing this planet with microscopic animals we had never seen and never imagined existed. He called them animalcules. So as my parents are trying to drag me up the street, and as I'm holding on to the door frame, I have a sudden realization. According to my atheism, there are no gods in this picture. There are no gods in the sky, there are no gods beneath the earth. But there are gods in this picture. Where are they? They're in my parents. They're in the absolute passion with which my parents are determined to drag me up the street. And if those gods are in my parents, they're in me. So my job at that point became turn the lens inward. I wasn't the first one to do this. Sigmund Freud had done it long before, 60 years earlier, and to look for the gods inside. And then um, I saw a film called Black Orpheus, and Black Orpheus was about the Macumba rituals in Brazil. It was a French film. And... Um, and I was entranced. That was the kind of ecstatic experience of the gods that I was looking for that didn't exist in my Jewish religion, so far as I knew. Um, and then, and, and I also heard that there was a book called The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And I was 14 years old, and that book, that book grabbed me as if it had been written specifically for me. 
So I spent four months looking for the book and finally found, we didn't have Amazon in those days and Buffalo is not a book rich city. And I finally found a copy and it was as if William James had written this specifically for me. It was as if William James had taken the mystic experiences of people like George Fox, who saw blood pouring from the skies and rushing down the streets of Litchfield in England and um, of St. Teresa, who had lain in her cell at night, her stone cold, dark cell and felt angels coming through the walls and piercing her with a lance and felt herself transported with this astonishing love of God. It was as powerful as a psychedelic experience and having the angels take her high above the earth where could, she could see the whole landscape and just be filled with a love that she never wanted to lose in her life. So William James laid roughly seven of these experiences out as if they, he were laying them out in Petri dishes on a lab bench. And as if he were saying to me, I can't understand these experiences with the tools of my time, but you're coming along over 50 years later and you will have tools that I didn't have. So I leave these to you to explain. Um, and, <clears throat> and I was obsessed. This was fascinating to me. Then when I was 16, I was in a new high school. My parents had been kind enough to send me to a private school because frankly, I wasn't doing any learning in, in public school because I was too busy reading two books a day. I was reading one book under the school desk and finishing it and then going home and reading another book. I was too busy getting an education to pay attention in school. But my parents promised me they would send me to this gorgeous school with 30 acres of greenery and everything. But they made me promise that I would do something I'd never done before, study. That I would actually try to do well in this school. And I took that promise very seriously. So, but I ended up with all the same kids who hated me when I was younger. Um, so I wasn't well liked in that school at all. But when they had something that actually had to get done, see, get, becoming the president of the class was a popularity contest. The most popular kid became president. Vice president was a popularity contest. The second most popular kid got voted vice president. Class, um, the class secretary went to the most popular girl in the class. And the class treasurer went to the most popular Jew in the class. So um, I had no shot at those things. The kids didn't like me. But when it came to doing something, these popular, popular kids had no clue. So they were anxious to get rid of things that involved actually practically producing something. So we had something called the program committee. And they voted me the head of the program committee for two years in a row. Now, what's the program committee? Every morning, the school day started with an assembly with all 350 kids in the school. And I got to program those assemblies two days a week and I had to MC all five of them, which uh, Otangelo is a frightening experience because if you've never been in front of an audience before, you get stage fright for the first two months. It drives <laughs> you crazy. And then it becomes as natural as breathing to go in front of an audience. And one day, the juniors came to me and they said, um, we're going to have a dance. Could you advertise it for us? Now, they didn't understand the bitter irony of what they were saying. If there was a party of any kind in Buffalo, New York, especially a dance, I was invited to stay as far away as possible, preferably Cleveland or Albuquerque. Um, nonetheless, I said yes to advertising their dance. And I put a piece of music on the turntable, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. So I went to the front of the stage, the very center, in front of this audience of people who basically hated me, and I started dancing. Now, Otangelo, I cannot dance. I cannot do the box step. I cannot do the foxtrot. I cannot do the waltz. <laughs> I can't do any of them. So what I was doing was totally freeform. And apparently, it looked like a Looney Tune, you know, the cartoons. Um, Drawn a Night with Chuck Jones, the artist who made the Looney Tunes, was on LSD. It was one of the craziest things you've ever seen. So I saw the eyes of the people in the audience who loathed me widening. 
and I saw their energy, their individual energy envelopes disappear and their common energy come together in a big amoebic blob. And I felt that energy reach out to me like the pseudopod of an amoeba. And I felt all that energy go through me and I had an out-of-body experience. Um, I felt that I was on the ceiling watching all of this take place. And that audience energy went through me, went to somewhere around my head, was utterly transformed, utterly transmogrified, and flowed back down again. And then I saw the pupils widening even more. Um, and the energy flowed back. And it was a crazy, wild experience. I'd never had an out-of-body experience before. And when it was over, the audience did something they had never done before in my entire time at that school, and they would never do again. They didn't do it for homecoming queens. They didn't do it for football heroes. They didn't do it for returning foreign students from Italy. They, they surged down to the, for the front of the stage. They picked me up on their shoulders as if they had been practicing this all their lives. They carried me out of the auditorium on their shoulders. They carried me up the hill to the building where we had our classes, and only then did they put me down. So this was my experience of the kind of mystic rapture that William James had been talking about. So when I was doing secular shamanism on my rock and roll stars, on people like Billy Joel or uh, Billy Idol, um, I was looking for the roots of soul that came alive and incandesced that way. Um, that created this kind of uh, uh, experience where an audience of anywhere from 3,300 to 30,000 people felt, felt lifted out of themselves, felt had an ecstatic experience, um, and in which the artist himself or herself had an ecstatic experience, an out-of-body experience. I knew that from my personal experience, what that was like, and I dug for that inside of my artist. And those are the gods inside of us, Otangelo. Those are the gods inside of us that I was seeking. Those are the passions I had seen in my parents when they tried to drag me up the street to the synagogue. So my life, and, and because and my atheism became God-obsessed when I was 13 years old. So that's why so many of my books have God in their titles. There's also the Muhammad Code how a desert prophet brought us ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Boko Haram. And all of these are about the ecstatic experience because in essence, the ecstatic experience seems to be the most personal experience of our lives. And yet it is the most social experience of our lives. It takes place most of the time in the presence of other people. Most of the time when somebody is in a drum or some musical instrument, and we don't know it, we don't realize it, because we forget it. But when we go out to a party at a disco, um, and the music starts, and we start dancing, we have that kind of ecstatic experience. But we're using alcohol or drugs, I don't use either of those, alcohol or drugs. But we have our alcohol or drugs to blame it on. And we incandesce the way, imagine a charcoal briquette, and you soak it in lighter fluid. And then you light the match. Well, we incandesce as if we were the charcoal briquette and having the match applied by the music. And what are we? We feel a part of something larger than ourselves, the way St. Teresa felt a part of once there was an angel piercing her with a spear, that's all of the heavens that are incorporating her. That's all of God that's incorporating her. But what is the larger whole we really feel a part of? It's, it is the spirit, the soul of the group that we become a part of. We become aware of our presence within the group, but we become aware of it on a deeply emotional, unspoken level. Hitler knew that. So Hitler would have torchlight parades in Berlin at 10 o'clock at night. And the sidewalks would be so crowded with enthusiastic Germans that if you were in that crowd, you could lift your feet off the ground and still stay upright, pressed by the bodies of the people around you. And when those, um, when those soldiers, seven abreast, started to march down the street with torches in their hands, 
you felt elevated. You felt exalted. You felt that mystic experience. You felt that transcendent experience of being a part of something much larger than yourself. And Hitler told you exactly what you were a part of. You were a part of Ein Reich, um, I, what's Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. You were a part of one tribe, one state, one leader. Um, but whether, no matter how you identify it, he was right. He was right that you become a part of the soul of the group, whatever the soul of the group happens to be. And one of the things that I preached to my artists was this. When we go through adolescence, when we are 12 or 13 years old and are beginning to mature as sexual beings, we're confused as hell. And we're confused because our instincts and those of our parents um, are telling us that we have to be ejected from the family. We're going to have to find a life and an identity outside of our family, something we've never been confronted with before. And ever since uh, 1815, every generation in Western civilization has been radically different, has had a radically different set of experiences from the previous generation. Um, if you grew up in the age of typewriters, um, that was one thing. But kids these days start using smartphones and tablets when they're 12 months old. And by the time they're 16 months old, when they're still barely talking, they can navigate the complex landscape within that tablet better than you or I will ever be able. The first that. words that my daughter was saying was cellular. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So the deal is that we grow up, well, we're born with twice as many brain cells as we need. And the basic way the brain works is by keeping the cells that prove useful and throwing away the cells, killing the cells that don't prove useful. Well, the cells that are made useful by that tablet and cell phone are very different from the cells that have been useful in people like you and me. So our children grow up with a radically different set of emotions than has ever been expressed before. There are still no words for their emotions. And they feel terribly alone. They feel that they are insane. They feel no one will ever understand their feelings. And if they dared reveal their feelings, people would throw them out of the group. Um, and then along comes an icon like Joan Jett or Prince or Michael Jackson. And in some way, that icon reflects the identity of those kids, reflects the shared experience of those kids, and lets those kids know, no, they are not alone. They are part of a group. In fact, they are part of a movement, which is a vital thing to have affirmed within you when you're 12 and 13 and 14 years old. Um, so that's what an artist does. And where does the soul of the group come from? It comes from all of these individuals who have a common experience but have never realized it before. And from what happens when you put those people together, because a group has a radically different form and identity than the individuals within it. And an icon helps give voice. It's the tongue of that evolving group. So what are the gods inside? The gods inside are the voices of the soul of the group. Um, and I mean, the Jewish God was a tribal God. It was a God that differentiated a very specific people, a chosen people. Um, what was the God of Christianity? Well, the God of Christianity was the God of the people that Christianity was able to bring together at any given time, it was a small number of people um, in the days of when uh, Jesus was still walking the earth in Israel. Uh, it was a larger number of people when St. Paul reinvented the religion entirely after Jesus' death and made it uh, something in which, with which he hoped to gain followers within the Roman Empire. It was something else in 322 AD um, when Constantine accepted it as or grabbed onto it as the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
but it represented the soul of the group, no matter how small or big that group was. Um, so that's it. That's my hunt for the gods inside. And, and, and the stories and all of the adventures and all of the stuff that I'm not able to tell you because it's just a lot, but it's fascinating, um, is in uh, Simon Michael Jackson and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. And that book has been named the best book of 2020 by the New York Weekly Times and the LA Weekly Times. Wow. Um, someone uh, in the chat, in the side chat, w would like to ask you something. Yes, uh, Mitchell, can you ask, can you put here the, your question? Yeah, I've met, uh, not met, but I've seen Michael Jackson in 1996 in Rio de Janeiro. Wow. Um, yeah. And um, what did you I, think? Well, I, I mean, it was exactly what you are talking about, that group feeling of all these people seeing him dancing there. And that was like in an ecstasy. You know, it was it was really there. I mean, I was doing mission work in a favela in, in Rio. And right. he went and he made his uh, clip a part of the clip. Um, uh, they don't care about us, something like that, um, in that favela. And uh, I was the only white guy in in the favela because <laughs> I was uh, doing my mission work there. But uh, they were only uh, uh, permitting local people to assist the show, and only the the the, the ones which were filming the crew. So right. it was uh, quite a, a very interesting experience, and uh, I met some people from the crew as well. And then, uh, uh, well, it was uh, interesting. Well, Michael was more than interesting. If you knew him up close and personal the way I did, he was the closest thing to an angel or a saint that I've ever met on the face of this planet. Um, Michael had a quality of awe wonder and well let me go back to the first two rules of science so what saved my life when i was 10 years old and nobody wanted to have anything to do with me including my parents and other kids um the book that saved my life said the first two rules of science are these the truth at any price including the price of your life and it gave the example of galileo and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there Look, in fact, for things that you and everybody around you take for granted are in, and are invisible to you and bring them into visibility. And it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek looking at, um, at pond water and looking at fresh human sperm. It never occurred to me until about 30 years later where he got the fresh human sperm. But at any rate, and he discovered that it's riddled with animal kills as well. The first rule is the, law, the rule of courage. The second is the rule of awe, wonder, curiosity, and surprise. Michael Jackson was the second rule of science incarnate, in the flesh. And I saw that the first day that I met Michael. Um, I was out, Marlon Jackson, his brother, has a pool house, a house next to the pool. And it's not really a house, it's a little building, big enough for one big room on the first floor, and for another big room on the second floor. And the big room on the first floor is lined with video arcade games, which are things that nobody in his right mind could possibly afford one of, much less a whole wall full of them. And there was a billiard table in the middle of the room. So the brothers and I were standing around. They put me at the center, and they were flanking me on either side at the billiard table, looking at merchandise, and I was trying to explain to them, you try to do the most astonishing show in the world, your merchandise has to be of truly astonishing quality. And then I heard the screen door open. Well, remember, Angelo, I did not grow up around human beings. In my bedroom, I had lab rats, guinea pigs, and guppies, and none of them knew normal human rituals. So I didn't know normal human rituals. But when I was 19, somebody had seen how pathetic I was, not knowing how to <laughs> navigate in the world, and had taught me that if there's somebody entering a room who other people want you to meet, you walk up to that person, you put out your hand, and you say, hi, I'm Howard. Now, from everything that I had read, you cannot do that with Michael Jackson. I had read a stack of over a 1,000 clippings. The stack's ridiculously high. And every single one of them said, Michael Jackson is a bubble baby. And if you reach out to touch him, 
he will shrink away in fear. So I walked over to the screen door and I stuck out my hand and I said, hi, I'm Howard. And I'd never done it before. And Michael stuck out his hand and shook my hand with a perfectly normal handshake and said, hi, I'm Michael. When and was that, Howard? This would have been, I believe, 1983, 1983 or 1984. So Probably basically when he was on the top when he released um, uh, the, the Thriller. Uh, it was after yeah. he sold 36 million copies of Thriller. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. So he was the biggest phenomenon that popular culture had ever produced. Yeah. And um, com comparable only to the Beatles and Elvis Presley, but he outdid both of them. Um, so I said, look, I've got a press release and I need to get your approval on it. I'll read it to you. Um, well, can I read it to you? And he said, yes, let's go upstairs. So we went upstairs and the upstairs room was filled with keyboards and amplifiers. Some of them stacked to the ceiling. So Michael found an amplifier to sit on and I found an amplifier to sit on. They have to know my relationship to writing to understand this story. When I was 12 years old, in an eighth grade, uh, a girl in my class had done something that had never happened to me before. She looked at me. And then she did something even more startling. She made eye contact. And she said, I told my mom you understand the theory of relativity. Well, Odangelo, I didn't understand the theory of relativity, but I wasn't going to confess that to her. <laughs> Neither do I. I. Yeah, so the only thing I had going for me was that the kids called me the sickly scientist. So as soon as school was out, I jumped on my bicycle. I pedaled to the library where the librarians literally knew me better than my mother. And, and I said, give me everything you've got on relativity. And they rummaged through the stacks and they found a great big fat book written by Einstein and two collaborators and a little tiny skinny book written by just Einstein himself. So I put them in my bicycle clamp. I pedaled home as fast as I could. And I started reading the big fat book. Why? Because I had learned that if you put yourself through the most difficult thing, if you put yourself through a book you don't feel you understand at all, by the time you get to the end of it, you've understood something. But by eight o'clock that night, I was only 50 pages in. The book was seven words of English on a page, and the rest was all mathematical equations. And I've never understood mathematical equations. <laughs> so I had a sudden realization. It's eight o'clock. My mom's going to put me to bed at 10 o'clock. I have two hours left in which to understand the theory of relative relativity or be humiliated at school the next day. So I grudgingly gave up on the fat book and turned to the little skinny book. And in the little skinny book, in the same way that uh, William James had grabbed me as if he had written to me personally, um, Albert Einstein, who wrote this introduction, it felt like he grabbed me by the front of my shirt put my nose up to his nose and said, schmuck, listen up. To be a genius, it's not enough to come up with a theory only seven men in the world can understand. To be a genius, you have to be able to come up with that theory and then explain it so clearly that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of intelligence can understand. So Albert Einstein, one of my idols, was telling me personally to be an original scientific thinker you have to be a writer, and not just any writer. You have to be a superb writer. So I became obsessed with writing, absolutely obsessed. And then when I was in college at NYU here in New York City, I was taking poetry courses because poetry had been incredibly important to my life. And um, I was taking them from the poet in residence who had started the careers of a bunch of famous authors. And one day, he said, Bloom, stay after class. Wait until everybody leaves the room, close the door, sit down there. And he pointed at the seat opposite his desk. I need to talk to you. Otangelo, this did not sound promising. Um, so I waited until everybody left. I closed the door. I sat down in the bowling out seat. And, uh, and he said, look, you, last year, I asked you to be on the staff of the literary magazine. You never even showed up. This year, I'm telling you, you are the literary magazine. You are the editor. You don't even have a faculty advisor. 
The minute you walk out that door, you are it. Now walk out that door. So I walked out the door of the classroom and I looked incredibly confused. And, um, and a kid saw me and said, uh, it, it, you look like something's wrong. Can I help you? And I said, yes, I, I've just been named the editor of the literary magazine, Orangela. Why was I so horrified? Because literary magazines are the most boring things you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> they have these pale blue eggshell colors that will put you to sleep on the cover. They have a, a choice of typeface that indicates that whoever designed this thing had no aesthetic sense whatsoever. And if there were a rip-roaring orgy anywhere in town, you could throw a literary magazine into the room. Everyone would stop what they're doing, and the room would be empty in five minutes. So he asked me what was wrong. I said, yes, I, I've just been named the editor of Literary Magazine. And he said, why don't you come downstairs for a cup of coffee with me? Well, Orangelo, I didn't know what have a cup of coffee was. It, it's another human ritual. I simply didn't know. But I went down um, to uh, a coffee shop, and I ordered a glass of water, and he ordered a cup of coffee. And he asked me one of the most important questions I've ever been asked in my life. If you could do anything you wanted with this magazine, what would it be? And I said, it would be a picture book. So he said, there, there you have it. Go for it. So I organized a literary staff, and I also organized an art staff. And the magazine was, the, it was called the Washington Square Review. We printed it in a 12-inch by 12-inch format, like a record album cover. Um, we used full color printing. We used extraordinary paper, and the magazine caused a huge stir. And we won two National Academy of Poet Prize, Poetry Prizes. How old were you then? Oh, I must have been about 24 years old or something like that, because I had dropped okay. out of school for three years and okay. hitchhiked and, and ridden the rails and helped, and helped found the hippie movement, of all things. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, it caused a major stir on campus, and it caused a huge stir in the commercial art community in New York City. Um, we influenced the made some of the major magazines of the time. So when Mike, when I'm about to read Michael Jackson my press release, I'm reading him uh, the result of God knows twenty years of fix, fixation, fascination, practice, writing. And not just writing anything, writing poetry, writing, writing to make, writing to put together words in a way that will absolutely fascinate you, that you will find absolutely delicious, and that you won't be able to put down. And all of that was in my press releases and the bios that I wrote. So I'm sitting on one amplifier, Michael is sitting on another, and I start to read Michael the press release. And after the first two sentences, Michael goes, oh, and he slumps in his seat and well not seat his amplifier and i read him another two sentences and he goes oh and he slumps further in his seat and and he keeps slumping and and owing all the way through the press release and finally when i get to the end he says man that's beautiful did you write that so michael jackson was the only person i ever met Whoever saw all the art in a press release. And then we went downstairs and we had an appointment, with the art director from CBS Records. And she came with five of the most gorgeous portfolios you've ever seen, hand-tooled cherry wood, hand-tooled leather. And she laid them down on the billiard table and she slid the first one across to us. And it was by an artist named Michael Whalen, whose work was utterly fantastic. And uh, the brothers were flanking us. I was standing at Michael's left. Michael's left shoulder was against my left shoulder. His left elbow was against my left elbow. His left knee was against my right knee. So I could feel his body language, not just see it. And he opened the first inch of the first page, just the first square inch. And he went, oh, and his knees began to buckle. Oh, 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 oh. And Michael was having the first aesthetic orgasm I had ever <laughs> seen in my life. 
<laughs> and you could tell that Michael saw an infinity in just that first square inch. Michael saw more in that picture than Michael Whalen, the artist, had ever seen. Michael had this astonishing capacity for awe, wonder, and surprise. And Michael felt that because God had given him this gift of awe, wonder, and surprise, it was his job on earth to give that gift to his kids. And that was his mission in life. And because he was so single-minded about that mission, because he was willing to protect his kids at any cost, he also represented the first law of science, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. So working with Michael, and there are more stories in the book, because Michael's image has been tainted by all the sexual accusations. Um, I try to give you an accurate view of who Michael really is for a reason. Back in 1954, every sports physiologist on the planet knew that it was impossible for a human being to break the four minute mile, to run a mile in less than four minutes. And then two med students, Roger Bannister and a friend of his, started analyzing every bit of his running movements and so he could economize on energy. And in the end, Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile. And when he broke the four minute mile, he expanded the envelope of human possibility. All of a sudden it became possible for others to break the four minute mile. And today there are 1,800, 1,800 runners who have broken the four minute mile. Wow. Because Roger Bannister broke the boundary of possibility, opened the envelope of human possibility. Well, Michael Jackson has the potential to open the boundary of human possibility and open the boundary of human perception in the same way Roger Bannister did. How? With Michael's level of awe, wonder, surprise, and commitment to absolute truth and commitment to his kids. But for him to achieve that, I mean, I know he's been dead for 10 years, but for him to achieve that, people have to understand who he really was. And I try to give you that feeling of who Michael really, really was um, in this book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, because I've been in pursuit of the gods inside of us all my life, and Michael was some of those gods incarnate in a way I've never ever imagined could exist before. So it's an important quest, as far as I'm concerned, um, to reveal to you that that almost godlike capacity um, in Michael. You could say he's the purest human that I've ever met. And, and how could I, an atheist, relate to him? I've been after the gods inside of us all my life. And Michael believed in God. Yeah, very interesting story, uh, Howard. Um, um, my trajectory is uh, very different than yours. And I am a theist, a Christian, since I'm 18. And I came to the Christian faith uh, through a depression, which I went through when I was a teenager. And, wow. And I was look. I didn't actually know what I had and what my, my clinical situation was. But nobody understood me, and I just kept it for myself. And I had suicide attempts. And Wow. Yeah, and I tried um, uh, to find by myself a way out, and that went for some time. And then I said, well, when I was uh, a kid, my mom, before sleeping, she uh, made some prayers. And when she closed the door in my room, then I made my own prayer and prayed to God and asked him to help me at school and so forth. And that was a good time. And I felt that God was listening to my prayers and that I had some responses. And so I said, well, since I'm not doing that anymore, I think I should try that again. And maybe that helps me to come out from my depression. So I started to do that and I started to pray at night and ask God to heal me. Inside of me, I had something which I couldn't express or explain what it was, but it was something very heavy, something which was taking away everything that uh, makes life uh, being fun. 
and um, it wasn't uh, something that happened from one day to another, but in a gradual manner, it went away. And I uh, said, well, that's maybe the way to go. So I will investigate further. So I started to read the Bible. I read um, books like Eric Fromm. And then uh, at one day, a colleague at work, he said, well, uh, in what church are you? And I said, well, and, uh, for the moment, I'm no church at all. And he said, well, I am going to an evangelical church. Uh, uh, church, if you want, you can go there, visit there, and maybe ask some questions and so forth. And I said, oh, yes, I'm interested. I would really like to advance that. So I went there, and there they explained me uh, the Christian God, why Christ died on the cross for our sins. And I said, yes, I want that for me. I want to have continue that relationship. Uh, uh, I'm not in depression anymore. It works. So I believe that God uh, answers prayers. So I did that prayer. I was 18 years old. That was the 29th of December, 1984. And there started my trajectory. And right the next day, they had an evangel evangelistic campaign. They had it every Saturday on the streets of Zurich. And I went uh, there. And so since then, uh, it's 36 years that I'm seeking dialogues with atheists. Amazing. Um, yeah. And um, since the internet came, then in 2006 or so, I started to communicate with uh, atheists on uh, forums. And then came Facebook. And that actually brought me into science because uh, they challenged my faith and said, well, evolution is the, is the explanation for biodiversity. So whenever came a question which I did not have an answer to, 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 to give a rebuttal, I went to study science. So. That brought me into uh, uh, all these uh, origins questions which are related to, to God as well, and also philosophy and theo theology. And uh, the question is always, is there a God or is there not a God? Since that is a very fundamental question of our existence. And of course, if there is a God, then he has a purpose why he made us, why we exist uh, from where we came, from where we go. Uh, what created the universe, what created life, what created biodiversity. And today I can say that um, there is on, not only one leg, which is a uh, theistic uh, revelation through the Bible, which uh, is the basis and basics of my, my faith, but um, also natural theology and science. So I believe that science is a fantastic tool to uh, 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 lead to God, actually. Well, I do too. Um, it's just I don't believe there is a God. I believe that. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to read you something. I just found, dug it out of the computer. Uh, brace yourself. Since, since there is no God, it is our job to do his work. God is not a being. He is an aspiration, a gift, a vision, and a goal to seek. Ours is the responsibility of making a cruel universe turn just of turning pains to understandings and new insights into joy, of creating ways to soar the skies for generations yet to come, of fashioning wings with which our children's children shall overcome, of making worlds of fantasy materialize as reality, of mining and transforming our greatest gifts, our passions, our imaginings, our pains, our insecurities, and our lusts. This is the work of deity, and deity is a power that resides in us. So that's my explanation um, of a god. And since there is no god, if, uh, if perfection is at all possible, it's our job to achieve it. Since there is no god, and if not, omniscience is a possibility, we should achieve it. If there is no, since there is no god, um, omnip omnipotence remains a possibility, and we should achieve it. We, it's our job to take the God that we imagine and feel so passionately about and make him, her, or them come alive in this universe with justice, with compassion, with things that do not exist in nature. Compassion and justice are rare in nature. Um, and it's, but somehow we have been born with this dream of peace, compassion, and justice. Nature seems to have inserted it into us somehow in the evolutionary process. 
And it's our job to instantiate it, to reify it, to turn it from a fantasy to a reality. And it's not an easy job. It's a multi-generational job. I mean, flying, uh, we know that we were dreaming of flying in 800 BC because we have the myth of Icarus from that period of time, um, whose father made him wings with wax. And uh, it took 20, almost 2,800 years, 2,700 years, to take that dream and in the course of many, many generations to turn it from a fantasy into a reality. And in the same way that we turned the dream of flight from fantasy to reality, we have to turn the dream of a peaceful, just, and compassionate cosmos into a reality. And that is the work of God, whether God exists or not. Yeah, I see it that way, uh, Howard. Um, uh, in a certain way, I come from a presupposition that God exists, and based on that, I have um, approached my scientific research uh, and Actually, whatever I have uh, encountered and learned has confirmed what I already believe. But my approach with atheists is not to start with my um, uh, with the theology, with with a revelation, with the Bible, and so forth. My my approach is always to start with a cumulative argument for God's existence, which starts with the very basic question: Is there a God or is there no God? And, right. with a God, and with a God, I would just start with characterizing him as an intelligent, powerful being, which is above the physical natural world and which instantiated it, and which is a necessary being uh, upon which all the contingent things uh, rest and depend. Now, uh, that is, um, uh, of course, a philosophic, a theological, and a scientific question, and we do not have the ability to see beyond the physical universe and what is beyond that big curtain. So whatever position that we instantiate and that we take, it is actually a, a position of faith. So if you say, I am an atheist, in ultimate instance, you cannot substantiate that with proofs. You have to take that on faith based on what you know. And the same is with the theist. He cannot say, I know that God exists based on empirical proofs because, because God has not, um, uh, is not testable. He cannot be proven empirically. So all we have is, um, what, and what we can do is abductive reasoning to the best explanation of origins. So the question is, uh, first of all, I mean, there are many questions related to that. That starts with the origin of the universe, with the origin of the physical laws. Why is the universe finely tuned for life? Um, why is the, our planet finely tuned to host life? Um, how did life start? Uh, how do we explain biodiversity? How do we explain that we have a moral sense of what, what is right, what is wrong? How do we explain uh, conscience? which is a, a big problem for atheism. So these are all relevant and related questions to that basic one. Is there a God or not? And of course, the most basic one is why is there something rather than nothing? How would you, <laughs> uh, how would you um, answer that question? Well, I, first of all, I agree with you that atheism is a faith. Um, I, why am I an atheist? I have faith in my atheism. As you said, I can't prove that there is or isn't a God. Um, when I was working at the world's largest cancer research center at the age of 16, um, at lunch, I sort of ran a discussion group. And in that discussion group, we discussed at the top of our lungs whether there was a God or not. But that was an adolescent way of thinking of things. No, it's not provable one way or the other. And it's really not worth the time. Um, understanding the universe that we live in and its origins, uh, understanding that science is severely limited. Um, and, and that that means that there are all kinds of questions that science has yet to pursue. Especially, I mean, look at my book, Einstein, Michael Jackson and Me. It's about a spiritual pursuit from a science person. 
a science person who's been pursuing spiritual experiences. Why? Because if science cannot explain spiritual experiences, then science isn't science yet. If all science can explain is elementary particles and the movements of the heavenly bodies and genes, then science is not science yet. It's still barely scratched the surface of what it needs to understand, comprehend. So my next book, um, but it's going to take about five years before it comes out, is The Case of the Sexual Cosmos. Um, and the subtitle is Everything You Know About Nature is Wrong. And it tries to go into forbidden territories um, in science. Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me goes into forbidden territories in science. But nothing should be forbidden. If science cannot explain everything, it isn't science yet. It's merely uh, an adolescent or even childhood attempt. If this is the childhood of science. This is not the great maturity of science by any stretch of the imagination. Every question you raise, like the question of consciousness and how in the world this universe is tuned to produce life and how this planet is tuned to produce life. These are very, very valid questions that science has to start answering. And it doesn't matter whether there's a God or not. One way or the other, we have to understand things with science or we can't do the work of God. Um, so uh, that's a, an overly strong statement. We may be able to do the work of God even without understanding these things. Some people are just profoundly good. And at the beginning of my book, um, How I Accidentally Started the 60s, which is about my three years riding the rails, uh, in other words, riding freight trains illegally and hitchhiking and accidentally founding uh, the hippie movement, the opening chapter is about the night I was uh, in Eugene, Oregon, trying to hitchhike down to San Francisco, and a an old black Hudson automobile stopped to pick me up, and the guys inside of it were murderers. And for the first three hours, they tried to regale me with their horrible deeds, torturing people, murdering people. When they ran out of horrible deeds, then they tried to impress me by comparing their experiences with oral sex and who what woman had the most talented mouth for that purpose in Vancouver which is where they were coming from and then um, I finally said are you hungry because after they finished showing off all their murders and, and sexual experiences they lapsed into silence and I had made a bunch of uh, uh, sandwiches with um, Wonder Bread and uh, oysters and cream cheese but I have been taught to shoplift, which Otangelo, you know, I believe in the truth in any price, including the price of your life. And I'm horrified that I was taught that. But I had no money. And the group of people gathering around me had no money. So I had to feed this group. So I explained how I had I carried the, the can with the smoked oysters in my jockstrap. And that made them gag. They certainly didn't want to share my sandwiches. But then they said, um, look, you have to understand something. You must have two things in your life. You must have a purpose and you must have a woman. And until you have those two things, your life has not really begun. And they tried to save my soul, Otangelo. Three murderers spent an hour in a dark car on the way to San Francisco trying to save my soul. That is the inherent goodness and in even the worst of human beings. And the more of it we can bring to the surface, whether they understand science or not, the more of that inherent goodness we can bring to the surface, um, the better off we will be. So would you agree, Howard, that if there is a God, that will unravel a whole new question, which is, why did God create the universe? What is the purpose? Why are we here? Uh, where do we go? And so forth. Now, if there is no God, then that also will uh, entail a whole new bunch of, of, of consequences. And it is one of the most fundamental questions. And the question is, can you substantiate uh, the materialistic, naturalistic worldview based on uh, what you know, and uh, which is science, you are a science-minded guy. Do you think that uh, what actually already we have unraveled in regards of natural phenomena, 
how does that point to the no god hypothesis well it's not a god or no god thing again remember as you said um being an atheist or being a believer is all a matter of faith um and christianity makes a big deal over faith um faith is a, a, one of the key topics um in christian thinking um so i know that if we humans keep doing what we're doing in science and take on the challenge of things like conscious consciousness um and and aesthetic experience and ecstatic experience um and where that fits in the evolutionary timeline of the universe how it came to be why it's here what its future is if we pursue that we are doing the work of god the work of god is to take concepts like compassion and justice and warmth in the universe and to turn them into reality and the more we know the more capable we are of doing that plus our culture western culture has been evolving in what you could call a godly direction what do I mean by that? If you've been born in um, 1850, your life expectancy would have been 38.5 years. If you were born in 2000, your life expectancy was 78.5 years. And in some countries, over the over 80 years. Um, and that is a doubling of the human lifespan. That That's 40 extra years to the human lifespan. Um, now, the emperor of China was willing to give almost all the riches he had to get an extra four years of life. And in fact, the things he was given by alchemists killed him. Um, if he was willing to give all that he had for four years of life and we've got an extra 40, then we are rich in longevity beyond belief. Um, if you've been... Um, if you took a Stanford Binet IQ test from 18, uh, 1916, the first year that it was administered, and you gave it to an average bunch of kids on the street today, the kids who we are told have been dumbed down and shallowed by the internet, um, those kids would measure, their average IQ would be at the marginal genius level on that 1916 Stanford Binet IQ test. Why? Because in the last 204 years, we've added 35 points to the average IQ. If you had been alive in a um, either a pre-industrial society, the West in 1650, or in an, an indigenous society that allegedly lives at peace and harmony with nature and with their fellow men, your odds of dying a death at the hands of a fellow human being through violence would have been 10 times what they are today. In other words, peace has gone up by a factor of 10. And the average height has gone up by four inches. In Holland, it's gone up by seven inches. So we have accomplished these godlike tasks without knowing how we've done it. And in most cases, without knowing that we have done it. Remember, we keep preaching that uh, the 20th century was the most violent um century in the history of mankind no it wasn't it was peaceful by comparison with what was going on in 1650 or what goes on in indigenous societies so we have somehow been maturing godlike qualities as a social group as a cohesive collective without knowing it now could we do better by using our science could we do better by understanding a bit of what we've accomplished and then trying to outdo it because look if our great great grandparents could give us an extra 40 years of life surely we owe an extra 40 years of life beyond that to our great grandkids if our great great grandparents could give us an extra 35 iq points then surely we owe an extra 35 iq points beyond that to our great great grandkids if our great great grandparents could deliver us um a, a level of peace that's 10 times what it was pre-industrially, um, then surely we owe at least a doubling of the amount of peace in the world, if not a 10 times increase of the peace in the world to our great grandkids. And there's another factor. If you had been uh, the poorest paid worker in London in the year 2000, you would have earned what 
seven dock workers, an entire tenement full of dock workers, earned in 1850. So surely we owe um, a minimum wage that's seven times as high uh, as the minimum wage today to our great, great grandkids. Now, whether we have to be conscious of what we're doing to achieve it, I don't know. We've achieved all of these things without being conscious of what we're doing. But I, I believe, as a believer in consciousness and science, that the more our rational mind is able to comprehend these things and is able to exalt uh, and exalt in what we've accomplished and see its responsibility to accomplish at least as much in the future, the further we will go. And what is the slow perfection of this universe or the slow compl complexification of this universe? It's the long march into the arms of God. Well, I think that um, our brain has a, a high uh, plasticity and uh, we, we can, of course, adapt to, to the, uh, uh, what we need. And uh, uh, the modern world needs more and more that we, we know things and that we learn things in order to be able to, um, uh, in a certain sense, uh, survive, but have a good life and good quality of life. And, of course, all these things... Um, also physical uh, uh, length and age, all these kind of things, they have changed and they are adapting and evolving. And I think that I believe that God has created us in a way that we can adapt to the environment. And that is actually even something which is life essential. If even the smallest life form, a single cell, suppose the first uh, kind of life form existed on Earth, it had to have inbuilt in itself the ability to adapt to the environment. And if that would not be a given right from the beginning, life would not be able to exist and to perpetuate. So, uh, Well, I agree with you totally. Um, but there's an oddity here. Um, the environment that we have to adapt to is a cousin of ours. Um, we are all children of the Big Bang. And that includes stones, it includes oceans, um, it includes everything around us. So what God has been doing or what nature has been doing is pitting various parts of itself against each other, even though they are relatives on the family tree of life that goes all the way back to the Big Bang. Um, the family tree of evolution goes all the way back to the Big Bang. We are all children of the Big Bang. Um, and the universe has been complexifying or achieving more ornate and flamboyant forms by pitting parts of herself against each other. Um, or God has been doing that. So what is the child of uh, the Big Bang or what caused the Big Bang into existence? Well, I have a theory, again, back to when I was working at the world's largest cancer research lab, at those on noon, those lunchtime sessions that I ran, um, I was trying to figure out something called the charge parity and time problem. And the charge parity and time problem is if matter and antimatter are created at the same time in equal amounts, where's all the antimatter? And I worked out a big bagel model of the cosmos that you can see online. Just look up Howard Bloom, Big Bang. Um, yeah, I see that. Right, and and uh, not only did it explain where all the antimatter is, it also predicted dark energy, which wouldn't be discovered for another 38 years. So if this theory is correct, the universe comes from a nullity to a maximum, and then goes back to a minimum again, and then goes back to a maximum again. In other words, it's Big Bang, universe evolution, universe, it's not really decay, um, but universe collapse. Um, yeah, they call it the cyclic universe, which... Uh, yeah, uh, well, which I think repeats, of it as... Uh, but think of a photon. A photon does this as it moves, going from a maxima to a minima, and, uh, and it's constantly moving forward at the speed of light, no less. Um, and I see this universe as moving on a trajectory like that, lipping along from maxima to minima, from maxima to big bang, and back to maxima again. 
But that doesn't an really answer the question. So the question is, then where does all of this blipping, where do all these blipping big bangs come from? And that's beyond my grasp. It's beyond science today. We do not yes. know. I, I but have remember, heard. the other, the corresponding question is, but if there is a God and he's complex enough to create this cosmos, what made him or her or it? Um, and we're back to the same problem. Okay, um, I would like to give you two answers to that. First, to the question, is God complex? No, he is not complex because he is not made of physical stuff. He is a spirit, and the sp spirit is in its essence irreducible and a singularity. It is not complex. It is just a spirit. It is not made of physical stuff. Now, in regards of the other thing that you told about matter, antimatter, that is a very interesting thing, and I would like to read here. Quarks and antiquarks form via matter-antimatter pair production. Because of their nature, these particles instantly annihilate each other. However, during the Big Bang, a slight asymmetry in this pair production resulted in approximately one extra particle of matter for every 10 billion produced. It, it turns out that this one in 10 billion ratio of leftover particles happens to be the exact amount of mass necessary for the formation of stars, galaxies, and planets. As much as 2 in 10 billion, and the universe would not have just been filled with black... Sorry, and the universe would have just fi been filled with black holes. As little as 0 0.5 in 10 billion, and there wouldn't have been enough density for galaxies to form. So... The question well, I is regard that as uh, I regard that as uh, how do I put this politely horse puppy, um, and because my theory says okay, imagine a bagel with a tiny little hole at the center, otherwise known as a torus and topology, um, or a donut, if you will, and at the moment of the Big Bang, the Big Bang comes out of the tiny, 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 almost non-existent little hole at the bagel center. And the matter universe comes out on top, and the antimatter universe comes out on the bottom. So where is all the antimatter? It's in the antimatter universe. The two universes, um, each universe expands at astonishing speed. Um, and that is um, that is a basic accepted idea in science today. And then it slows down as it goes over the bagel's hump. And then the two universes have a common language, gravity. So they're like cannonballs. They go up to an apogee, and then they go back down again. Um, and these two universes are attracted to each other by their common gravity. So they begin to go down the slope of the outer bagel until they meet at the bagel's edge, and they annihilate and create another big bang, another hole in the center of the donut, the center of the bagel. And that uh, animation has had about 800,000 800, hits um, so far. Um, and it's been called rigorous by Martin Bojewald at, I think, the University of Pennsylvania, who's a mathematician and cosmologist. So, and rigorous is the ultimate compliment in the world of math. So, ah, I see the time um, is slipping by and I have to go take care of all of my work. Um, this is the beginning of my work day. Um, any any last questions? Yes, there was, was someone that had a question. Let me ask. Let me check here. Um, okay. Oh, how is it possible for Neanderthals to create a flute? When we now know the instrument they used couldn't have been more than 3,000 years ago. Well, wait, the figure is off. Um, the first flute was created approximately 40,000 years ago. And how did they create the flute? Um, well, humans, okay. Humans are a peculiar species. When it's snowing out and you've got three feet of snow on the ground, you can take your dog outdoors and your dog has a wonderful time. And he's, you're wearing a coat. He doesn't have to. He's got a fur coat. So he's capable of adapting to that temperature. 
when it's 100 deg degrees Fahrenheit or 95 degrees Fahrenheit and you take your dog out for a walk, your dog still wants to go outside. Um, he's well adapted to that 100 degree or 95 degree temperature. We are not. We were born naked without fur. We were born with a need to eat meat. How do we know that? Um, because there is a, a chemical in the gut that goes off only when you eat meat. And it travels to your brain and it tells your brain, the people you are with while you are eating this meat are good people, stick with them. It's a bonding hormone, but it only goes off when we eat meat. So here we were born to eat meat and where are our claws and fangs? We don't have any. We don't come pre-equipped at birth with either a temperature regulatory mechanism of the kind the dog has, even your cat has it, and we don't come with the ripping instruments that are needed to bring down prey and then rip the prey apart. Now, well, how could we possibly have been born without these vital survival tools? We were born onto a new world, the world of technology. We were, we evolved as humans after the first stone tools evolved, after the first humans using stone tools have been able to cut the coats off of animals and use them as temperature regulation devices for ourselves, for coats. And we became human in the age of technology. Um, so we were born to not have to carry around the things that we could make. And um, so when it comes, to, so we were born as the first truly inventive species. Now, ravens are inventive, crows are inventive. Many animals are modestly inventive. We're not modestly inventive. We're wildly inventive. So how did we develop the first flute, the first way, the way we developed the first stone tools? We really don't know. But we humans are born so that we need to do certain things. Your depression is one of the things that we humans are born with especially after the age of 12, when we have to eject ourselves from our family and establish a whole new life and a whole new purpose and a whole new identity, a whole new location in a new social unit of some kind that will accept us and welcome what we have to give. That's tough. And so we invent everything we possibly can to gain acceptance, to gain acceptance in that new group, to gain acceptance among each other. And uh, music, for some reason, soothes us. It brings a group together. It again brings out the collective soul of that group. And there was probably music of some sort long before there was the first blown bone flute. But the first blown flute, uh, the first bone flute, came in an age of radical invention. It came about forty thousand years ago, and that was a an period of an explosive development of new inventions. Um, the, uh, the sewing needle and the whole process of sewing, um, the fish hook and getting creatures from the seas, um, and a vast plethora of other inventions. I mean, we went, we invented the first tools um, about 3.1 million years ago, and they were simple. Um, they were hammers and we gave them blades by chipping them on one side. For 700,000 years, that toolkit remained the same. Why? Because we were evolving as modern humans, and we hadn't yet become the species of radical invention. Then, 700,000 years or more after the first stone tool, we came up with the first radical innovation. Not just chipping the stone tool on one side, but chipping it on two sides to make a blade. But around 40,000 years ago, we suddenly saw garbage as gold. Um, when we were chipping those stone tools on two sides, we were creating flake after flake after flake and throwing the flakes away. 40,000 years ago, they realized the value of the garbage, the value of the flakes. And those flakes provided arrowheads, and they provided knives, 
of a kind that made the old stone tools look ridiculous. So we are homo inventicus. Um, we are man the inventor of new technologies. And without new technologies, we cannot survive. And the, stone, and the bone tools, I mean, the bone flutes are one of those inventions. Okay, Howard, do you have time for one more question from the Yes, side one more question, yep. Okay. Ask what the absolute truth is. Well, to me, the absolute truth is what I read you a little while ago, that God is an aspiration, um, that God is an aspiration that lives within us, that deity is a power that also lives within us. Not all of us will necessarily answer its call, but some of us will. And those few who do will consistently drive evolution forward, will consistently drive that slow march toward the arms of God into acceleration. To me, that's the absolute truth. Okay, Howard, um, I obviously, as a theist, disagree with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have not have uh, much time uh, to, to go a little bit deeper into where the science leads to, but it was really fun to listen to your uh, stories. And um, uh, I hope that eventually, if it is uh, interesting for you, we can have another opportunity and dwell a little, little bit deeper if science directs to what you believe that uh, material, the material world is all there is and needs to be, or if eventually a creator is on the bottom of reality and if he is necessary. Well, remember something about that first stone flute or the first, first bone flute. It was a technology used to re-sculpt the human spirit. So the human spirit has been a vital part of this evolutionary process um, ever since the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it is a very important question how conscience and intelligence and uh, 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 the ability of speech and everything, how that emerged, if matter can create that, if dualism is true, or eventually if uh, monism is true. So these are all very important and interesting scientific questions related to origins. But um, as you said, you, you are uh, busy or will start your work, but um, I've really enjoyed to, to listen to you, to talk with you. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you at my channel. And if it was as well for you, I hope that we can eventually in another opportunity continue our conversation and dwell a little bit deeper in these questions. I've seen that you had a speech about uh, photosynthesis, which I really thought was very fun. And I've uh, studied that uh, really in depth and it would be really interesting to have some exchange in a future, in a future um, uh, opportunity about these kind of things. Well, I look forward to it too, Otangelo. So this has been wonderful. Great. Okay. So once again, thank you very much uh, for your coming here, to, for your time. I look forward to have another opportunity. And I thank also in, uh, in the name of everyone that has assisted this live stream. And so I say uh, goodbye, everyone. And you have your last word, Howard. Well, just uh, continue making God come alive in daily life through wonder, amazement, and awe, and things that wonder, amaze, and awe us. Fantastic. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for everyone assisting us. See you next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a good night. Um, where is the little off button here? Um,